Grab your Bibles, turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. Ecclesiastes chapter number 7, the title of this evening's message is simply this, Striving for a Better Life. Striving for a Better Life. And uh, what better to look at than God's Word to find that. We hear a lot spoken about the better life uh, uh, here in the world around us. And uh, Solomon does a great job in a sense of addressing it. Solomon's an interesting guy, isn't he? And uh, certainly the wisest man, but also in some ways the weakest weakest man, if you ever think about it, and uh, his wife caused his heart to depart from God and his wives uh, and so forth. Kind of interesting if you think about it in that sense, and that kind of comes out in, uh, not kind of, it really comes out in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is an interesting book as we consider it this evening. Uh, it, it was authored by Solomon. It provides a very earthy or human look at life. Uh, have you ever read Ecclesiastes like I have, and you've gotten to it in your devotions, you're like, man, this could be depressing. <laughs> it's all vanity, it's all empty, it's all pointless almost is what Solomon says, and, and that is true in how he presents it. We read of life being described through the eyes, now don't miss this, through the eyes of human hopelessness. See, that's really what he's saying. And, and Solomon's saying, you know what? I had the opportunity, the chance to follow after God, but I really kind of went my own way. I allowed my wives to lead my heart away from God. And, and he looks at life like, wow, all the labors of man are vanity. Vanity of vanities. He looks at it through the gaze or the lens of human hopelessness in some places. Other times, he characterizes life through, a clear, through the clarity that's provided by regret and hindsight. Isn't that interesting? You know, sometimes regret has a way of bringing things into focus. <laughs> it helps us to see, man, I should have done it that way. I should have handled it better. I should have done it. I should have lived this way. And regret, hindsight, likewise, boy, what do we say? Hindsight is? 2020, some of you are with me, amen, okay. So I'm like, where is he going? There's many quotes out there, okay. Some of you got it. Hindsight's 2020, right? We can see perfectly, ah, it brings it into clarity. And that's really many of the ways that, that Solomon does. The book of Ecclesiastes is quite interesting. Now, somewhere along the way, I'm sure we'll find ourselves in it on a Wednesday night. But let me, for tonight, kind of break it down. The first 11 or so verses of chapter 1, he provides for us the problem of life stated. If you had a moment, you could glance over there and you see that's where he describes his vanity of vanities. The labor of man is vanity. And just, man, it's, ah, oh, it's empty. It's, it seems pointless and so forth. So we see the problem of life stated. Then from chapter 1 to about chapter 9, we see the problem of life studied the problem of life it's an expose of the hopelessness and vanity of man and all his work all his play all his pursuits under the sun and really Solomon who is wise and is given by God he really exposes it he really shows my what you live for what I live for outside of what God says to live for is really vanity it really brings about very little, and uh, I, we'll get into that even tonight in some of the things he says here in chapter 7. And then the last part, chapters 9 through 12, Solomon presents to us the problem of life solved. Here really is the greatly beneficial part of Ecclesiastes for you and I, because in these chapters, he gives us great wisdom, wisdom that gives a proper perspective of life. Okay, if life is vanity from a human hopelessness perspective, then what do I do with it? And then he concludes, obviously, we know well, verses 13 and 14 of chapter 12. That's the easy to remember, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14, okay? And he says what? Here's the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. And so I'd put it into three ways. He says this, fear God, keep his commandments. And verse 14 says this, remember the coming judgment. Remember the coming judgment. So he kind of concludes everything in those three thoughts, those three statements. Uh, fear God, keep his commandments, remember the coming judgment. Everyone's going to stand before God is what he says in verse 14. And so that's uh, those chapters, he really helps us to understand that. Well, back here in chapter 7, it's really some of the hopelessness of life that Solomon gives us. And yet in the midst of it, he gives us some good principles, some good proverbs by which to live. Uh, principles that can serve as guideposts in our lives if we will heed them. In fact, he puts them in the context of this. Here's what's interesting. He says this is the better life. The better life. 
He uses that term at least 11 times in chapter 7. We'll, we'll look at just a handful of them. But he continually says, here's what's better. Hey, hey, here's what's better. This is better. You don't want to miss it. This is better. Do this. Do this. This is the better life. You want things to work out better for you? Here's what you do. You want life to go better for you? Here's what you do. And uh, I like good, but I like better better. I like better, better. And so that's what he says. Here's what's better. Here's the things that you can do. And uh, what's interesting about this, because he's, he's encouraging us, here's how you strive for that better life. The irony is that Solomon is probably looking back. Now, young people, don't miss this. Solomon is probably looking back. We don't know exactly the, the timetable when he's writing this. I would guess that in some degree, a good majority of his life has already passed. And he's looking backward. And he's wishing that he would have done things differently. And in doing so, he's realizing, boy, when I pursued that, and I pursued this, and I put this in front of God, and, and I saw that person put that in front of God, and they made that their life's pursuit. That, that's all vanity. And he's looking back, and he's saying, wow. I messed up some things. Mankind has messed up some things. And so Ecclesiastes is full of these principles and proverbs that gives us advice based on this. Get it? Don't do what I do. Listen and do what I say. Learn from what I have done, in his case, sometimes what I've done wrong. You know what's interesting about that thing? Because the fact is this. There is much wisdom in that. Do as I say, not as I did. Now, a lot of times, we'll focus on the hypocrisy of that statement. But the reality is, we can look at the life of Solomon, and we can hear him say, you know what? I have really messed up some things. I have really allowed my heart to stray from God, and I started living for some things that I ought not to have lived for. I, 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 had, I prioritized things in my life that should not have been a priority. I focused on things that should, have not, that should not have been my focus. And because I did that, listen, I have some things to share with you. Now, listen to me. Often, from a human standpoint, we'll... we'll will write that off. A young person, a teenager will write off a mom or dad that try to encourage them, hey, don't do as I do, do as I say. May I tell you, yeah, I understand that from a human perspective, we may want to leap on the hypocrisy there, but there is much wisdom to be found in someone who's walked through something and gone through it, has regrets, has learned something and says, listen, let me give you some counsel. I know there's many in our church who have walked some difficult roads. You, you've gone through some waters, some of them by your own design, some of them by your own choices, and there are places that you would wish on no one else. And I have heard you say, boy, you'd never want to do that. That's not good. Boy, I regret that. And, and boy, I, I want to let someone else know, avoid that. Don't go down that path. Can I tell you, there's wisdom that can be found there. And such is the case here uh, with Solomon. I would encourage our young people, don't dismiss the wise counsel that comes from your parents and your grandparents and godly folks who can say, I've been there, done that, when it comes to certain things. And they don't want you to go down a path. And they come alongside and say, hey, I'm the path you're headed, I have unfortunately been there. And by God's grace, I have gotten away from that and corrected it. But I don't want you going there. You see, my friend, I could put it this way. In their regrets, you can find many a safeguard. In their regrets, you can find many a safeguard. There have been times, and that's been my privilege as a pastor, as a youth pastor, just as a Christian friend. I've sat down with a parent who is weeping tears because of decisions and choices they've made in their life, and their heart is broken, their heart is burdened, so that their child would not go down that same path. And young people, I want to tell you right now, you ought to listen to a parent like that. Oh, is it far more better for your parent to have never gone down that path? Surely. Of course. It is so much better to live a life that is not stained and marked by sin. But if your parent has walked a path and they've gone down that like Solomon here, boy, there is wisdom to be found. In their regrets, safeguards can be found. So, so listen to it. And as I read Ecclesiastes, I'm thinking, man, I, I know Solomon. His heart turned from God. He allowed things to become more important. But there is much to be learned from Solomon. And he says so in the very beginning. Notice what he says, verse number 1 of Ecclesiastes 7. 
A good name is better than precious ointment. Let's stop there. A good name is better, okay? So here's the first thing to a better life, all right? The better life is found through striving for a good name. The good life is found through striving for a good name. Now, he's not talking about the name Stephen or or Aaron or Mark. He's not talking about our name, our moniker, as we might describe it as such. He's telling us that uh, life is best spent striving for a good name. What is that good name for yourself? What's your reputation? It's how others know you. It's, it's kind of the footsteps you leave behind you. As I put here, it's one's character value. It's one's character value. Okay? So young person, and, and even us as adults, we hear things like this. Here is the evaluation that is made of character, these character values. Have you ever heard this said about someone? Well, he or she can be trusted. Well, he or she is a good worker. Uh, He or she is kind. Uh, He or she is a good person. Uh, He or she is a a person, a good person to have around. They're a good influence. He or she seems to always do what is right. Uh, He or she uh, controls his or her mouth. The list could go on and on. When we hear things said in young people, you ought to strive to, uh, for a good name. You ought to uh, be able for your parents to say, oh yeah, he does this, she does this, in a very positive way. Because the negative can be true, correct? Oh, that it would never be said of you and I. Oh, huh, he can't be trusted. Oh, she can't control her mouth. Oh, 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 yeah, boy, they're, they're not really a good worker. You see, when Solomon writes, boy, it is better to strive for a good name. He's saying, than anything else you can think of, it, it's better to strive to have that. In fact, as Solomon wrote back in Proverbs about that. He said, what? A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Riches. In context, if we were to adapt it and apply it to his message here, uh, we would say that Solomon would encourage you and I to strive to gain a good name, a good reputation, rather than striving to gain great riches. And if you do so, you're going to experience a better life. In this verse, though, and that certainly correlates to what he said back there, but in this verse he says this, uh, to do so, a good name is better than a fragrant ointment, okay? Um, You can probably tell when people around you are wearing perfume or cologne, okay? People wear it, smells good, and, uh, and so forth. I remember as a little child the perfume my mom wore. I remember the cologne my father wore and still wears. They still sell it today. Isn't that amazing? I still do. My kids know it well. They've come to learn it and so forth. Yeah, that's what he's referring to. I mean, that's good. It, it, it's nice. It, it's, I, I'm so thankful for cologne and perfume that covers other smells. Amen? Yeah, it's good to have a good ointment. And we think in context and uh, what they would use it for in burial. They would use it in special occasions and things like that. A fragrant ointment and so forth. Sometimes medicinal, sometimes in other ways. Man, it was a profitable thing to have a good ointment. Christ was anointed at times and, and so forth. So we get that. and The anointment of a king and so forth. And So it, it is in a very positive content, connotation here. Um, and yet you and I know sometimes that, boy, you smell something like, woo. That stinks. Have you ever been to a cologne or walked through a store and walked by a cologne or perfume counter counter and go, whoa. Okay. Um, I remember sometimes when I used to send samples of cologne or perfume in magazines or something. Their papers, you open it up. And and sometimes I'd be like, who would want to wear that? Smells like a skunk. But anyway. Yeah. Ugh, that stinks. Now, you know what's uh, really what's happening here? You know what God is saying? He wants us to know that a good reputation smells better on you and me than the best perfume or or cologne we could ever find. A good reputation smells better on you and me than the best cologne, perfume, ointment that we could ever find. You ought to strive to have a good reputation. Strive to uh, leave behind a good smelling uh, heritage or reputation. You know, I see too many young people, teenagers, college age, others younger than that. Children give little thought to what others think about them. 
what others consider, and specifically godly people in their lives, their parents, the leaders in church, a youth pastor, a teacher, and so forth, they give little consideration. What, what do they really think about me? Now, here's what's interesting. Look up this way, young people. Uh, we have this verse, and certainly Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 11. You probably know it. Even a child is known by his doings. Now notice it. What is known? What's their reputation? Whether they be pure. And whether what they do is right. So isn't it interesting that Solomon says, man, we begin to develop reputations early. We begin at a young age to develop what people think of us, whether we are doing what's right, whether we are pure in action and in deed and in thought. People are going to see that and develop a reputation. So Solomon in Ecclesiastes 7 says, listen, it is so much better than striving and pursuing for riches, for fame, for popularity. Don't strive for those things. You want to have a better life? Strive for a good reputation. Strive to have a good reputation in the eyes of those that matter. See, it's crucial for young Christians to care about your reputation. Christians of all ages, the character value as it's perceived by the right godly people. Now, that's the key, too. What do the right people think about you? Uh, your godly peers, not the ungodly or spiritually indifferent people. Sometimes, listen, teenager, sometimes you're much wor more worried about your coolness factor than you are whether you have a good name. The fun factor. Do people think I'm fun? Can I tell you? You're going to reach the age, I'm at it, where people don't care if you're fun. It ain't going to matter. Because you reach a certain age, you can't be fun. You're too old. Okay, so caring about fun factor and coolness factor will only last so long in all seriousness. Can I tell you, hey, don't be so concerned about being cool and fun and accepted. You be concerned about having a good name, a good reputation, one who was godly and acts righteously and speaks kindly. And people can say, oh, man, that's a sharp young man. Oh, that's a sharp young lady. Boy, they love the Lord. They know God, they love God, and they want to live for God. You ought to strive to have that kind of name. Why? Because God says that's much better. Much better than its riches, much better than a, a beautiful smelling ointment. Ah, listen, you know what I found out about cologne and perfume? It wears off. Good name will not if you continue to strive for it. You continue to strive for that in your life, and building that is your character. The wisest man that ever lived, in spite of all his faults, is here used by God to tell us that the better life is found in striving for a good reputation, that of being righteous and godly, obedient, uh, doing what God, pleasing him in all things. And so it begs the question tonight, are you enjoying the better life because you're concerned about having a good name? Are you striving for godliness and obedience to him and pleasing him in all things? You want the better life? Strive for it. Young to old alike. Strive for a good name, a good reputation. Number two, we find in the second part of verse one. Look at it. And the day of death, so we can add the word better because that's what he's saying. And the day of death, better than the day of one's birth. Now what a statement. Okay, that's quite the statement. So number two, the better life is found through valuing the day of death over the day of birth. Now, in all transparency, this may very well be a cynical view statement of a bitter, regretful man. Some commentators believe that he's just speaking from his own sorrows, his own regrets, his own failures. In other words, he looks back on the landscape of his life and he says, man, I blew it. I just want this life to be over. In other words, Solomon viewed his birth just as the beginning of troubles and death, the end of his trouble. Now, I find that interesting. And very likely, and I'm sure somewhere in here, and you can find that because he certainly speaks of death being that way and, and, and so forth. So I think there's validity to this, and I think that's wrapped up in here, okay? So in that, understand, aren't there a whole lot of people who come to this and arrive at this viewpoint in life when they don't know God? I mean, I've talked to people who are older, and I just want to die. You ever talk to somebody like that? Like, man. <laughs> I forget who it was. Was it Job? And forgive me, I should remember this. But talking about, he said, you know, cursed be the day I was born. You know? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, that's, that's such a, whoa, why? What's the big deal? Because this, this view. Now listen to me. You want to know what life without God, without Jesus Christ is like? 
You wish for death as an end to all your troubles. You think that's the answer. You think if I can jump off a bridge, if I can commit suicide, then boy, you know, I, I, just, I can be done with it all. And Solomon is there, very uh, depressed if you might. It's easy to read from chapter 1 to chapter 9, and boy, you, you pick up that this is the way Solomon thinks. So you can conclude that at times he is very depressed. Can I tell you, you're going to be depressed when your heart's not right with God. It's going to happen. You're going to look at life through a dark lens. You're going to think everything's terrible and horrible and sorrows are full. I mean, th that's what happens when you leave God out of the equation of life. And Solomon's finding it out, and he's presenting that to us. And yet I think there's also a way in which this second part of verse 1 is an extension of the first part of verse 1. Uh, it notes uh, that to go out of this life with a good name is better than the joy of birth. Now let me put this into context for us, and let's think about it for a moment. Uh, I think every parent here would agree with this perspective as we think about this truth. Okay? I, I doubt there's a parent here, a grandparent here, um, who would not uh, admit that the birth of a, a child is one of the most joyous and happy occasions. The, the, the miracle of life, it just never gets old. Each pregnancy and birth is a miracle, a blessing, and a joy. And, and I think every parent here, every grandparent would agree. My, to see life come into this, uh, this earth. Uh, Ruth and Ryan just about to go through it. I mean, it's exciting, okay? And uh, you say, well, you say that because you're a guy. But anyway... <laughs> No, it's exciting to see that little life and, and God, and it's amazing. And uh, some of those fathers have talked about it before. Jeremy and I have been through it a few times. Today. <laughs> and uh, we talk about it every time. That, that's pretty amazing. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see life coming. That's, it is joyful. I, I remember, I remember still the day that Reagan was born. And the joy that filled my heart and every time since. And we're done. But anyway, <laughs> and it's joyful. It's exciting. It's, I mean, life is, ah, that life being produced. And that is a joyful moment. But listen to me. Now listen. But you take that same parent, and they'd have to admit that to see their child grow up, through the young chi uh, child years into teenage years, and to watch them then grow into a godly, responsible young adult, to witness them pass through the different seasons of adulthood with a godly character, with a good reputation, seeing that, wow, they're making a good name for themselves. Can I tell you, that brings a mom and dad lasting joy. Oh, the birth of a child? Yeah, that's joyous. There's nothing like that. But I'll tell you, you want to bring mom and dad lasting joy? Make a good name. Have a reputation of living godly, of doing the right thing, of living for God. In fact, the New Testament writer, he spoke of the impact upon a parent that a child's reputation of living godly and following the truth of God's word can have. You remember what John wrote? He says this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You want to know when, how the day of death is better than the, the day of life or the day of birth? It's because, boy, when you can look back on a lifetime and you can say, I've left a good name. For a parent, there's little much or there's little that brings as much joy as seeing a life come into the world. But I'll tell you, a lasting joy is seeing your child live for God. To establish a good name for himself or her so. so the impetus is on each of us to value the day of death better than the day of life by striving to leave a good reputation when that day comes. Now, let me put it this way, okay? To have life is great. That's a good thing. It's wonderful. But what is better is to be prepared for death by focusing upon leaving behind a positive reputation of knowing God, loving God, and living for God. Life's wonderful. To see it come about is great, but so much better is to be prepared for that day of death. You know what else? I think the Holy Spirit uses Solomon here to also make this point. For the righteous, for the wise person who's put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, may I just remind you the day of death is indeed better than the day of birth. When we have come to find Jesus Christ as our Savior, 
Why? Well, this life of separation from God, this life of being bar- bombarded continually by sin and the temptations of the devil, this life full of pain and heartache at death will be over. And it won't just be over like some people wish all the trials and troubles be gone, but for us, we will be ushered into the glory and the joy of the Lord forevermore. I love that statement. When he's talking to a servant, well done, thou good faith, enter thou into the joy of your Lord forever. Man, what is death? Hold, why is the day of death better than the day of life for a Christian? My friend, because we're going to be done with this old world and we begin what eternity holds and that's being with our God. And all that that entails in heaven and the the descriptions that we enjoy so very much. It's why Paul said this, to die is gain. Gain. To die is gain. You ever realize that some of us like to look at our... uh, look at our pocketbook, our checkbook, our bank account, and we like to see a gain instead of a loss, amen? You like to look inside your wallet, and you hope they're like rabbits, your bills produce, reproduce. They procreate. doesn't happen, by the way, okay? I wish it did. You like to see and look in your purse and find out you actually have more money than you thought you did. You like gain. We all do in many different ways and so forth, except when it comes to weight, okay? We all like gain. Can I tell you what death is to the Christian? Death is gain. It's gain. It's a thing we should cherish and treasure. And so even Solomon, uh, whether Solomon knew the Lord, we can say certainly it seems from his early life, and I would say he was probably very, very backslidden. He had gotten off, and boy, he did not reap all the blessings and benefits he could have in his relationship with God. But I think somewhere in Solomon he realized, man, I've made a muck, a mess of things, Whew, I'm ready for death because death is going to be gain. Even as a backslidden Christian who hadn't lived a life that he ought to have, death is still gain. But for us who've lived so much, my goodness, how much live for the Lord or at least strive to live for the Lord, death is truly gain. And when our attitude that death is gain, uh, when that is such the case, the world is better. Why? Because you know what I am constantly reminded of when I think that death is gain? This life is temporary. It's transient. It is but for a moment. It is a stepping stone. It is a necessary means to get what awaits us in heaven. And you know what that does in turn? That truth makes life doable. It makes it better. Because this is what I know. My life in this sin-cursed, sin-stained earth is even but a vapor. And the time that you and I will spend with our God for all of eternity will be forever. This is nothing. And so, boy, when you value your day of death over the day of your birth, you come to realize, wow, it's going to be so much better. And it makes this life better. Verses 2 and 4 kind of carry on the same thought. Look at verse 2 and 4, if you will, with me. It says this, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Jump down to verse 4. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Okay, I have come to love verse number 2. I have used it. Many of you who have attended funerals of late, I've used it in several funerals, especially when I know there's going to be an unsaved person there present because it goes contrary to human thinking and perspective to say that it would be better to go in the house of mourning to uh, the house of death uh, instead of the house of feasting celebration a party i mean really who in their right mind would choose to go to a funeral instead of a wedding that's human perspective right why would you do that i mean it's so joy i mean why would you want to why would you choose to go to a funeral instead of a wedding But Solomon says, for producing an accurate focus on life and death, for consideration of the fact that death awaits all men, that this life will soon be passed, the house of mourning is better than the house of feasting. It's not speaking about an obsession with death or being preoccupied with death, but rather, you know what Solomon is saying here? He's saying when our, um, let me back, oh my, I'm so far behind. Here we go. All right, there's number three in case you missed it, sorry. Okay, the better life is found through the careful consideration of the end of one's life. 
okay? The better life is found through the careful consideration of the end of one's life. But here's what Solomon's saying. He's saying this, death is inevitable, okay? To avoid thinking about it and the life that awaits afterwards is truly foolish. Did you see the statements here that he makes, especially in verse number four? He says, now wait a minute, the foolish heart, and I love how he speaks of hearts. In fact, the first four verses, he really deals with the heart, a heart attitude, and, and what you're looking at and so forth, what you're valuing, your heart. The heart of a fool doesn't want to think about death. The heart of a fool just doesn't want to, why? Because you know what? Man truly fears death, doesn't he? Man really fears death. It's why many people don't want to think about it. They don't even want to speak about it. Others jest and joke about it because down deep inside it, they fear death. I remember a couple of years ago talking to a young man in his 20s and just over here in Otter Lake. And we knocked on his door and he came and, and, and I asked him about death and life afterwards and he made the statement, I've never really thought about it. I've never really thought about death and what lies ever hence. And then kind of in the further conversation, he said, because I really didn't want to. You know why a lot of people don't want to talk about death? When you bring up, hey, if you die today, where are you going to spend? Oh, I don't, I don't want to th- talk about it. I don't want to think about that. Why would you? I mean, that's, that's morbid to think about death and so forth. Because people fear death. In his secular book entitled The Denial of Death, there's an author, Dr. Ernest Becker. He wrote this. The idea of death the fear of it haunts the human animal. You can see that he's probably an evolutionist, okay? Like nothing else. But notice his perspective is correct. It is a mainspring of human activity. It produces human activity. What is that activity? The activity is designed largely to avoid the fatality of death, uh, to overcome it by denying in some way that it is the final destiny of man. And he says it well. I mean, here's an unsafe guy when he talks about the final destiny because the reality is death is not the final destiny of mankind. It's to stand before a judging God in either heaven or hell because of it, what they have done with Christ. But do you understand what he's saying? From even a secular standpoint and viewpoint, he's saying, wow, man fears death and he wants to do anything he can to change it. He he wants to avoid it. He wants to deny that death is coming. Uh, The search for the fountain of youth. I used to think it was Dr. Pepper, but it didn't work. The search for pills and everything else, longevity of life, and we, we want to prolong life. We want, ah, why? Because man fears death. But aren't you thankful the person who knows Jesus Christ, death has no more victory? Nothing to fear. And yet, for the one who does that, that fear is well grounded. Why? Because when every child is born, the countdown begins. When we enter this world, the countdown begins. Every living soul has a built-in fuse. Some fuses burn quickly, while others burn more slowly. But every person's fuse is burning. And it will burn out in this thing called death. As Solomon stated in in this verse, did you catch it? Death is the end of all men. All men face it. The countdown will someday come to an end. That's what he says. I like the statement, for that is the end of all men. That's why it's good for us to see the death of others, to be reminded that this is true, that no one is going to live forever here on earth to consider our own inevitable death, not just from the perspective of a reputation I'm leaving behind, but whether or not I am spiritually ready to face the afterlife, whether I am ready for what comes next after death. That's why Solomon says, you know what? It's much better to go in a funeral home, in a church, and see a casket. It's much better to go into the house of mourning because it brings up some questions. It challenges challenges us to think and to evaluate, all right, am I ready? Is death is inevitable, it's coming, am I prepared? Number one, am I ready as an individual person in that I have put my faith and trust in Christ for salvation? Am I saved? Because you know what? Death is coming for every person. Barring the rapture for believers, the fact is death is coming. It is inevitable. And as he puts it, man lays his heart to it the end of all men. Number two, am I ready as a believer in that I have lived to hear my Savior say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in all that I have given you. Are you ready? 
He says, man, it's good for you and I. Every time we hear of a, a saint passing away, every time we hear of someone dying, every time we attend a funeral, we ought to ask ourselves this question. Number one, am I saved? Do I know Jesus Christ is my Savior? Number two, if I am a believer, have I lived in such a way that I'm going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Am I ready? Am I prepared for death in this way? And then number three, Am I ready? Take it a step fall farther as a follower of Jesus Christ, as a disciple. C can I say that I have lived daily to please my God in all things? That takes it a step farther. Faithful in the time that he's given me, the life that he's given me, but now daily have I lived to please him. Am I prepared to hear that from my God? Have I lived this life in such a way? You see, when the living gaze upon the end that all men face, they lay their heart to it, is what he says in verse 2. They lay their heart to it. Man, I, I need to consider these things. I need to think about these things. I, I need to take them into consideration. Am I ready for death? It is better for us to go to the house of mourning. See, Solomon's saying that the heart of the wise will move him to come face to face with death, to prepare for it, to make ready for the inevitable. R Moses wrote it in Psalm. The psalmist recorded some of the prayers of Moses, and this is one of them. Psalm chapter 90, verse 12, the prayer of Moses, you remember this? So teach us to number our days. Why? That we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Moses is saying, listen, none of us are going to live forever. We've we got to realize death is inevitable, so let's apply our hearts to wisdom. What are the questions I should be answering today in my life in preparation and looking ahead? What are the things I need to take into consideration? But listen, what is the converse? What is contrary -wise? The fool. What does the fool do? He doesn't want to go in the house of mourning. Can I tell you, I've had funerals, I've preached funerals, which people came in here and sat in a pew, and they dazed out. They didn't want to be here, but soon after they left, and they went and had their can of beer. They went and did everything else they wanted to do in life, the entertainment. May I tell you, that is the heart of a fool. Because they do not sit here and consider, uh-oh, what their fate, what they faced, I one day will. Am I ready? And the psalmist says, or excuse me, the, the Solomon says that the heart of the fool would rather dwell in the house of mirth. The fool wants to deny, not even think of death. The fool doesn't even want to think, I need to prepare, be ready. I need to be, answer these questions. He'd rather live for entertainment. The fool will squeeze as much fun and partying and entertainment out of this fleeting moment called life as much as he can with little thought for eternity and death. But may I tell you tonight, death always comes. It's inevitable. This life is not made better by ignoring death. By pretending it is not going to happen. By avoiding even thinking about it. I know that there's at least one member, and I'm sure there's many more here at Font Story Baptist Church. At least one member that has told me they have a family member that does not want to talk about death. They do not want to hear about life afterwards. They don't want to talk what's going to, about what's going to happen when they die. Can I tell you, my friend, that is not the better life. The better life is to think about death. So it moves us to prepare for it. Not pretending it's not going to happen. I'll put it this way and we're done. This life is made better through the wise consideration of our own impending death. By diligently preparing for that day, by ensuring that death is no more than a glorious graduation day because we have trusted in Christ for our salvation. Boy, I love that. You know, I use it a lot. I think of death as a graduation day, amen? We just celebrated our graduates. Those from kindergarten to first grade, they think they're big stuff, amen? Our high schoolers to college age. College into the rest of life. Can I tell you, I'm waiting for graduation day. Whether by death or by rapture, that is going to be a great day. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? That's the better life. If I could put it in three takeaways, this would simply be it for today. It's simply this. Number one, strive for a good name. Young people, strive for, for a good reputation. Strive to have people say, hey, man, they, they love the Lord. They're living for God. They're obedient. They're trustworthy. Ah, boy. Have a good name. Number two, value the day of death and prepare for it. 
value it, that graduation day, value it. Value it as, man, I, whatever time I have left, I want to leave a good name. Whatever time I have left, I want to prepare for that day. And then number three, consider often, what does death hold for you? Shame and sorrow as you stand before your God and you will not hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Disappointment because he'll say, wow, you know, there was a majority of your life, those days you didn't live to please me. Or will the opposite be true where you and I say, you know what? Every day I thought about death and what lies afterwards. It is not a morbid thought. It is a simple reality that I'm going to stand before my God. It is better to go into the house of mourning. Are you ready?